This lecture is going to talk to you about how you evaluate a classifier. So we've studied, you know, regression models a lot, and we've used measures like um, mean squared error, the residual sums of squares, or R squared, as uh, measures of, of how well the model does. But how do we how do we evaluate a classifier? So um, there's a number of measures that get used, and uh, I'm just going to kind of list a couple of them, and then we're going to go into depth on one of them. So um, one thing that we can do is use the deviance, or AIC, which is just the deviance plus 2P, two times the number of predictors. And, you know, that's, that's uh, often used as a, as a measure of how good, uh, say, a logistic regression model fits the data. Um, a measure that gets a little closer to, you know, the actual use of this is called the classification rate. So the way to think about the classification rate is it's the percentage of correctly classified cases. So um, the way to think about this, I, I, I was making a little sketch here in, in, um, in PowerPoint, and um, this is the way you can think about it. So, you know, in truth, uh, a case is either going to be a yes or a no. So let's say we are trying to classify emails as either spam or not. Okay, so an email, in truth, will either be spam, so yes, or it won't be spam, no. Now let's say I build a, a classifier. Um, my, my classifier, or my model, is ultimately going to say yes, that thing is spam, or no, it's not spam. Okay, so the classification rate is just going to be what percentage of cases are either um, where the, the thing is spam and my model gets it right, or the thing is not spam and my model gets it wrong. All right, so we're going to take, I just noticed my formula was wrong. We're going to take the, if A is the number of cases where the, um, the email is not spam and my, my model said it's not spam, and D is the number of cases where the model is spam and my model says it's spam, then A plus B over the sum of those four is the classification rate. Sometimes it's, it's written as the misclassification rate, which would be uh, you know, one minus that. All right, so that's the classification rate. Now there's a bit of a, uh, a problem, which is that the classification rate depends on some cutoff. Okay, so I like to call this cutoff C. And so the, the, the whole idea is this, if the predicted probability is, uh, is greater than C, we, we, we're going to call it a yes, otherwise we call it a no. And um, we, have to, we have to choose what that C is going to be. Now, let's just think about this for a minute. Um, you know, if, if it's an email, and uh, if I get it wrong, okay, so what do I mean by get it wrong? You know, this is not um, a spam email. It's really an important email from my boss, okay? Yet my, my classifier uh, says, you know, this is spam and puts it in the spam filter and therefore I, uh, I, I, never, I never see it. Um, that's gonna be pretty costly, all right? So we'd wanna set the threshold very high. I'd wanna have like, a, you know, it have to be 90% uh, probability that this is a spam before I put it in the uh, spam filter, all right? So that, that's what this C is gonna be. And it's, it's going to be some value that I get to choose. Now, the choice of this C is going to depend on misclassification costs. So um, I want to talk a little bit more about different types of misclassifications. So if we go back to this slide, um, I'm going to use some language from uh, medicine. So a true positive rate is going to be um, what's the probability that my model says yes, given it really is a problem. Okay, so uh, let's say this really is spam. So we're down in this bottom row. Um, what is the probability that my model says it's spam? So that's gonna be D over the C plus D. Um, a false positive rate then is gonna be where my model says it's yes, but it's really not spam. So of the emails that are not spam, so these are real emails, um, the false positive rate is going to be B over A plus B. All right, so with, with those in mind, 
let's um, let's just think a little bit about um, you know how this cutoff should depend on um, my uh, you know the, the costs of these. So we've we've already discussed spam filters, and if um, you know we, we know that the cost of a false positive, where I uh, put it in my spam folder when in fact it's a real email, could be quite high. Therefore, we want to set the threshold very high before we call it spam. Now, let's consider another situation like airport screening. All right, so uh, in the case of airport screening, what's a false positive? Well, that's where my metal detector goes off suggesting you have, um, you know, some, some weapon on you, um, but you don't have one. So in fact, you don't have a weapon, but the uh, scanner says you do. My test says you do. So that's a false positive. Now, if you think about it, what's the cost of a false positive? Well, maybe there's a little bit of additional screening. Um, as opposed to a false negative is where, you know, you really have a weapon on you, but uh, my, my scanner fails to detect it. All right. So um, in that case, a false negative where I miss the weapon um, is, is far more costly than a, a false positive. Uh, another situation where um, that would was very similar would be something like cancer screening. You know, so if um, if my cancer screening test suggests you have cancer when you don't have cancer, um, you know, you, you're you're probably going to be very stressed and and you're going to have to um, you know get a higher level of screening. Um, but uh, that that cost is probably not as bad as the cost of a false negative, where I um, uh, you know you really have cancer and I miss it. All right. So in, in both the case of airport screening and cancer screening, we probably want to set the um, you know the, the threshold, the cutoff value very low. So if I think there's a 10% chance you have a you know a, a, a weapon or something, then I should probably do the higher level of screening. All right. So that is why um, the cost of a false negative depends on you know these um, you know the cutoff is going to be determined by the cost of the false negative. All right, so um, another um, uh, very useful metric that we can use, and this is going to lead us up to probably the most commonly used metric, it's called a receiver operator curve, or ROC curve. Um, I just noticed these are backwards. This should be sensitivity. This should be specificity. Um, it's defined correctly up here. So sensitivity is a true positive. Specificity is a true negative rate. All right. So um, I'm going to build up to an ROC curve, and in order to do that, let's um, let's take a look at at this uh, defaulting customer data set that we've been discussing in class. So remember that the uh, outcome variable that we care about is does the customer default in the first couple months of the membership, and so I ran a table on this, and you're going to see that. About 88% don't default, uh, maybe 12% um, do default, so 11.7% do default. So a very s simple classifier is that I'll just predict that everyone uh, stays. Now, if that's the case, notice my classification rate is 88.3%, uh, which is which seems very impressive, but um, you know that that's kind of a stupid classifier. So let's go see if we can beat it. So let's go fit ourselves a fancy logistic regression model where I regress default, and I'm going to put uh, basically all the variables I've got. So down payment, payment type, use, age, and gender. And so now this is going to produce a set of predicted values. And so that gets stored in fit dollar fitted values. For starters, let's just set our cutoff at C. So in other words, any predicted probability greater than 0.5, I'm going to say is going to default. Any value less than 0.5, I classify as not defaulting. Now, uh, let's go look at a cross tabulation of this. So in this bottom row, we have all the, uh, the, the positives. So these are people who really cancel. Uh, in the top row, we have all the negatives, so people who did not cancel. This column is all the people for whom my model says will default. 
and then this column is everyone that uh, you know will not default. Let's first compute the classification rate. So the classification rate is going to be all these true negatives plus all the true positives. So you're going to see I've written that here, divided by the total sample size. So we had to do a lot of work with a fancy model to go from uh, you know 83, 88.3% to 89.2% classification rates. But again, I'm not I'm not wild about the classification rate. I think um, we, we have a better measure coming up, which is uh, through the ROC curve. So let's um let's go look at the true positive and the false positive rate. So if I take 118, so that's the number of true positives, divide that by the sum of those two numbers, I get about 28%. So let's go over the interpretation of this number. You could say that 28% of the people who actually default are identified by my model. Uh, another way to say that is of everybody who actually defaults, that's the, the row, my model picks up on about 28% of them. The remaining 72% are, um, uh, you know, they're, they're false negatives. My, my model says, no, they aren't going to cancel, but they do cancel. All right, let's look at the top row. So the top row is all the, the true positives. So if I take, um, sorry, all, all the, those who don't cancel, so, so they never leave, um, you're going to see that my model uh, falsely predicts that about 2.6% of them are going to go away. So those are going to be false positives. So the model uh, says that, that they're going to cancel their positive, yet uh, they don't. Okay, so 2.6% false positive, about 28% true positive rate. All right, now let's just think about what would happen if I change my threshold or cutoff value. So I'm going to drop it to, say, 0.3. So in other words, it's much easier to be classified as someone who's going to cancel. So I would expect the fraction of true positives to go up. However, the uh, fraction of false positives will also increase. So it's it's I, you know I'm calling more people positives or you know cancelers, um, therefore I'm going to get more of the true positives. And notice the you know the true positive rate shoots up to about 67 percent, but the false positive rate goes up from 2.6 to about 8.2 percent. All right, now let's just say we could evaluate the true positive and the false positive rates for all possible cutoff values. And I do that on the next page. So um, I've generated an ROC curve by hand up here. You, you probably never want to do that, but um, if you're interested in how to do it, uh, here's, you know, here are the, the details. It's, it's very easy to specify it. Um, the result is shown down below. So let's go take a quick look at this. So notice I'm putting the true positive rate against the false positive rate, and let's just go see the values that we just worked through. So remember, if I have a cutoff of 0.5, I had about, what was it, 28% true positives and only about 2.6% false positives. Now, if I were to lower the threshold for what I consider as a canceling customer or positive, so we dropped it to 0.3, uh, well, because I've lowered the threshold, I'm seeing a lot more true positives. So now I'm getting about 67% of all the people who are really going to cancel. My model identifies the cost of this is that my false positive rate has increased to, uh, what was it, about 8%. So if you come down here, that's about 8%. All right. Now, let's just um, study this a little bit further. Notice if I th set my threshold very high, 0.9. I don't uh, call, I, I call hard, hardly anybody a, a positive, and therefore my true positive rate's very low, but I don't make any mistakes. As I start to lower that threshold, notice I start to capture more and more true positives, which is a good thing. And the nice thing about this model is that 
the um, I'm not going off to the right very quickly. In other, in other words, while I'm catching more true positives, the false positive rate is, is not increasing that much. I mean, in fact, you have to go all the way up to about here or so before the, the curve starts to flatten out a lot, meaning my false positive rate is going up. So this is a pretty strong model. So let's just think about what the ideal model would look like. So let's go back to my PowerPoint, and I will show you what the ideal model looks like. So that's off to the left. Um, I like to call this the crystal ball model, where um, I, I, uh, you know, I get everything right. So in other words, um, I can have a threshold such that my true positive rate is 100%, yet my false positive rate is zero. Um, so that would be the ideal model. Now we're going to summarize this model in terms of the area under this curve. So AUC, oops, AUC is, uh, is, is, is an, uh, an abbreviation for area under the curve. The area under this curve is 1, and what this means is perfect classification or a crystal ball. Now, let's go consider another situation where um, as soon as I start to lower my threshold, my true positive rate increases at the same rate as my false positive. This is going to be the worst of all possible models. And this is just random guessing. Um, the AUC of it will be 0.5. Okay, so the way to interpret AUC is simply this. Uh, bigger is better. Uh, you want, uh, you know, value of 1 gives you a crystal ball. Value of 0.5 is the worst of all possible models. By the way, if you have an AUC less than 1, so if the, if the curve sort of bows like that, what that says is your classifier is really stupid. It's wrong more than it's right. And um, it's actually not a bad classifier. You just do the opposite of whatever it tells you to do. All right, so if you had an AUC of zero, that would be a, a crystal ball model that's always wrong. So do whatever it says not to do, and you'll always be right. All right, let's go back to the uh, course packet for a second. Um, that's how we in interpret, um, you know, the, the AUC or area under the curve. AUC is um, one of the most important classification metrics out there. So you'll commonly use that. Now, um, I thought I'd give you a little example of how this is used. And I've given you, um, you know, a second model now. So this first model is the one that we had for uh, you know, all the variables in the model. We're going to compare classifiers. So let's, let's make a new classifier, and that's going to be FIT2 down here. FIT2 is uh, one where we've dropped two of the key variables. So we got rid of uh, down payment and use. Now, this is the type of thing we're going to use this for. So there's a, a function in R called um, uh, RO, uh, it's, it's ROC, so this is how you, it's in library PROC. You um, give it the true Y values and the fitted Y values. All right, so I'm going to make myself an ROC curve for the first model. Then I'm going to use this add equals true and the color equals two. So color equals two means red. Add means don't erase the previous plot, but add this plot to it. So I've already done this. Let's go look at it off here in, in R. And um, you're going to see the black model, the one, that's the one that we've been studying, has an AUC of 0.91 or 0.909, which is uh, pretty close to 1. That's a very strong model. However, this red model, where we got rid of two of those predictors, um, is not nearly as good. So AUC is about 0.78. So the area under that red curve is substantially less. The black curve dominates the red curve. So we would always choose the black curve over the red curve. All right, that's, um, that's it for um, AUC curves. That's going to be our primary metric for evaluating classification models.